Biobalance HealthCast episode 174, Gender Differences in Medical Treatment. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the Biobalance HealthCast. This week we're going to be talking about something that's in the news uh, recently, actually 60 Minutes, and Leslie Stahl did a show on this topic uh, last Sunday. Um, but it, it's a thing that Kathy and I have been talking about for a long time because it's so frustrating for her that this is the reality of modern medicine, and it's the reality of unacknowledged and unaccepted gender differences in the way medical services are provided, research is done, drugs are administered. Uh, mm-hmm. That there are huge differences in the way men and women process these things that have been known but unacknowledged for more than 20 years. It was a, there was a journal that just closed down, has been a journal for 10 years, called Gender Specific Medicine. Mm-hmm. And it was produced by the women of Harvard, the women doctors of Harvard, who wanted to make this obvious to everyone, and so they found research Mm -hmm. that showed the gender differences for medicines, gender differences for diseases, how men and women are different at at processing medicines and what we need in terms of dose. It's amazing how different we are in almost everything that we take or every treatment. And it's fascinating when you consider the care with which doctors deal with so much. I I was talking to a person the other day that was going to have a bariatric surgery, and they're really obese. Mm -hmm. And they had had a couple of meetings with the anesthesiologist because it's important to be able to calculate the the dosage amounts for them to keep them under during the surgery. Right, because of their weight. Because of their weight. And so doctors worry about things like that, Mm -hmm. but they make the assumption that if they give you a prescription and you're a female, Mm -hmm. that you're going to work and respond to it and absorb it or metabolize it the same way I do as a male. And they started this because they found out that the the first part of the iceberg, when Mm -hmm. when they, they saw this tip of the iceberg was Ambien, a sleep medicine, and they found that many women were very, had hangover. They're very tired the next day. Right. And then they realized that all the research had been done on men and the dose had been calculated on men. Well, men in general, not every man, but men in general have a bigger body mass, meaning height and weight, and that therefore the drug is distributed differently. So a higher dose would make sense for a man and a lower dose for women. But We've seen lots of things well, about the, this. The, it just came to the public What the just reporting now. said was that if, if you and I both take the same dose of Ambien at mm-hmm. night and go to sleep, mm-hmm. that in the morning, 40, more, 40 or more percent of that will still be in your bloodstream. Which so means I'll have a hangover. So you're going to be groggy and, and not safe to drive. Right. And I won't be. Right. And, and in the reporting, uh, Leslie Stahl said, was talking to this physician, uh, Dr. Larry Cahill, who's mm-hmm. a, a, a neurologist, and says... Well, how, how have they not known this? And he said, I can show you the original re- research that was done 20 years ago where there was a notation that said there are gender absorption differences that we need to think about. And they decided that's inconvenient. We'll just go to market with it this way. He said, medicine has always made the assumption. <laughs> that I just can't believe it. That you as a female mm-hmm. are just like me as a male, except you have some pesky little hormone things that yeah, sometimes that, mess yeah. things up. But, but other than those pesky hormones... It's all the same. And that, that philosophy or thought process also works in research. Almost all of the laboratory rats and research animals that medicine uses are male for right. the same reason. reason. The so, pesky little hormones in the female rats mess them up. Everything we know about medicines, everything we know about treatments mm-hmm. have to do with how males respond. Mm-hmm. Not how females respond. So basically, we're trying. We're taking the one size fits all. We're taking this huge dress and putting it on, and it's falling off <laughs> just, of us. Just a tuck here and a yeah, tuck there. Yeah, I mean, we're like pulling yeah. it in with a, you know, with yeah. with a belt because they did all the research on male rats, male animals, male people, mm-hmm. and then the irony is, the one thing that women and men have in common is testosterone. Yes. Not the same dose, not the same levels, but we both have it, and it's the one thing they ignore. It's the one thing medicine ha- it has blind spots 
to in terms of we're alike. Because everything else, we're supposed to be alike, but except so, testosterone. So when you say they ignore it, certainly doctors know that women make testosterone. Well, in many studies it says, well, we know that testosterone isn't made by women. And I'm like, how do they? I mean, it's like an assumption uh -huh. that they're making, and, and they haven't even looked it up to because see. Because you don't have gonads. We do have gonads. We have ovaries. And ovaries and make that's, testosterone. that's the mental glitch that they make right. to say, oh, well, women don't make testosterone. It's kind of like that men are from Mars, women are from Venus. It's mm -hmm. kind of like women make estrogen, men make testosterone. But the right. truth is women make testosterone and men make estrogen. It's true. Is that why I get moody? Yeah. <laughs> and as you get older, you get more moody because you're making more estrogen. <laughs> yeah. And the more weight we men gain, the more estrogen they make. Interesting. So we... So in one thing, we make the same hormones in different levels. Mm -hmm. It is different levels. Okay. But they ignore that. But then in everything else, it's one size fits all. It's, right. it's just such a, it's such, it, <laughs> it's such a contradiction. So I would get the same dose prescription for Ambien or for an antibiotic, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't get the same dose prescription or, or for testosterone. you wouldn't for mm -hmm. testosterone because right. they don't make testosterone that's approved for women. By, by the, the FDA. FDA. But they do make it. But people like me calculate, right. take care of both men and women, mm -hmm. and I calculate women's testosterone. And we have, not only do we have less testosterone than men, even though it's more than our estrogen, it's a higher level than our estrogen, right. but we have a smaller percentage that's active. Mm -hmm. Men have, a, have 10 times as much as we do. Mm -hmm. And the percentage that's active in men that's actually working is much bigger the percentage than women. And, so, and we explain all that in our book, mm -hmm. The Secret Female Hormone, and uh, about the way the that testosterone is metabolized and free testosterone and bound testosterone mm -hmm. and all that. So if you're interested, you can you can get our book, which is on sale the 1st of March, uh, and read that information. But in one of the chapters in the book, we also talk about the frustration that you as a physician have running lab tests when the normals, especially for mm -hmm. blood tests, are uh, normed or based on men. Right. And that women have different scores and that the tests don't even give you a, a, a place to mark that or notice that. Well, they used on testosterone, they used to say that zero was normal. Yeah. And so, I mean, I was one of the people that called Quest and said, zero? Really? Zero? Right. How could zero be normal? And they said, mm -hmm. well, lots of people we test are, nor are zero. I said, that doesn't mean it's healthy. It means... You tested a bunch of people who don't feel well, yeah, and it's zero. Yeah. So then they upped it to like 0.2. So what they do do with men and women, they do have different normals for men and women, believe uh -huh. it or not. But they adjust it to your gen your age, not your. It's not about gender there. It's age. So they say in this case, if you don't have any testosterone because you're old, that's okay. Okay, so they measure it against your age cohort, mm -hmm. not against your gender. Right. Well, gender and age. Gender and age. Because it's different for men and women. So the lab test does look at that, mm -hmm. but they're not giving either men or women healthy normals. They're giving okay. them just what's average for your age, whether you're healthy or not. Healthy right. is really when you're between 20 and 40 years old if you're a woman and 20 and 50 if you're a man. Okay. So that's what we should be comparing our hormones to. <laughs> so it's so you're complex. as sick or as well as most old people. Yeah, is what it tells right. You. And see, if we did that with everything, that's still wrong. But mm -hmm. the biggest example I use is how we test bones. And that's a new thing. We didn't test bones more than 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so when we do a bone density test, we compare all women to 29-year-old females. And that's exactly what we should do with hormones. But we don't. So they developed a good standard because every woman loses bone density as they get older. Right. So if I tell a 70-year-old, well, you're average for your age, that doesn't mean anything because that means your bones are thin and you're going to break, you're going to get breaks and, or uh, you're going to break your hip. But if I compare you to young, healthy women, that is significant. So the goal then is to find a way to restore people to what they had when they were young and healthy. Right. That's right. And, and with osteoporosis there are ways to do that right. now because they've set the norms for what young, healthy bones look like. Right, and they don't compare you to somebody in your age cohort like the blood labs do. Mm -hmm. So I have to just enter my the, uh, the young, healthy normals right. as I go. Right. So that's time-consuming, and, 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 
And it's also patients go, why are you doing that? And then I have to go mm -hmm. through this whole process. Mm -hmm. However, n let's get back to just regular medicines. Yeah. They tested um, cholesterol medicines mm -hmm. on men. I mean, that's how they did cholesterol right. medicines. And they said, oh, it's great. It has very few side effects. It has Well, in fact, in men, it has fewer side effects than women. But now that women take cholesterol medicine, it causes a lot of breakdown of muscle, which is huge in women. But it's different for women and men. The frequency is much higher in women than it is in men. They wouldn't been, have had the same side effect um, percentages if they had tested women. So in women, most women can't tolerate them. So so one of the, the issues for why this is such an important focal point now is the issue of side effects. Right. And, and historically, women have experienced a lot of different side effects that have just been dismissed or ignored or mm -hmm. discounted. Because it's because not in the PDR. The data doesn't show Because the data is just about men. Yeah. It's not in that big red book that your doctor looks up um, medicines in mm -hmm. because it doesn't happen to men very often. So they go, oh, that's infrequent. That's probably not there. Well, I've been reading a lot lately, and we've done a couple podcasts over the last year and a half about the differences in women with heart attacks and strokes right. as compared to men. How does this topic play in there? Well, we're, we were talking about medicines first. Now mm -hmm. we're talking about research about research for diseases. Mm -hmm. And we found that Men have a different kind of heart disease. They have a large vessel, like we can do a cath and see the goo on the inside of the vessels. Right. But women don't. Women have small vessel disease in the heart. And so we can do a cath, and they look perfect, and then they go out and have a heart so attack. So the big vessels that come in, which is where men would have, accumulate have a collection problems, of plaque. those we know a lot about, and, and specialists can deal with that. And, and our show tests up on look the, for on them. The scans. But for women, it's not those big muscles. It's, it's, it's the little, little bitty ones. ones. Right. And what happens then with a woman when she when she's having a heart attack? How, how would that she, be different? It's a different kind of uh, uh, presentation. presentation. Mm -hmm. Instead of the elephant, the classic is the elephant sitting on my right, chest, right. and um, I can't breathe, and pain in the pain, arm, pain, yeah, pain down the left arm. Uh, but for women, sometimes it's their jaw. Sometimes it's their face that hurts, and so, and sometimes it's not a crushing pain. Uh -huh. It's just a it's just an ache or a nausea. Oftentimes they feel they feel Sick like they thumb. have some kind of illness of, of their GI tract, and they're nauseated and they're sweating, which people think is a hot flash. Right. And that's a double whammy. Then, if then, you're an older woman, right? People are going to say, "Oh, it's just a hormone, those pesky little yeah, hormones." The pesky hormones. Let's get out of my ER. <laughs> are killing you. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, so so in that way, we're at much higher risk when we go to the ER, and somebody looks at us and they mm -hmm. t look at us like they look at men. They say, "Oh, you're not having a heart attack. Goodbye. You can go outside and die." Yeah. But they're also even if they take you seriously, and they do the tests that tell you whether your heart is in trouble. Some women have plaque on the inside of their big vessels, but mm -hmm. most have compromise or, or occlusion of the small vessels. So the, the big vessels, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, um, when you have tributaries to go right. coming into a large vessel, well, it's the opposite. The bigger vessel brings the blood flow, the artery right. to the heart, and the then it has these little tiny little vessels that actually deliver the blood right. to the cells. Right. So it's those tiny little vessels that get plugged up. So your big vessels look great. But so the, the treatments ones are... would obviously be different. I mean, I remember seeing a, a, mm -hmm. a video of a surgery that Michael DeBakey was doing where he detached an artery and mm -hmm. took forceps and pulled this huge wad of goo, goo. Oh, out of somebody's yeah. blood I've vessel. watched that. So, I've watched so Cooley do that. Pre pretty simple Long time to ago. do and put it back together. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about capillaries and, and micro veins, mm -hmm. it's different you can't treatment. do that. Mm -mm. You have to do vasodilation and, and you have to get the vessels to actually dilate, like get bigger. I mean, it's it's much harder to fix that. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it doesn't look, you may have, you may have a um, plaque on the inside of your vessels, but they're not occluding those vessels. So it doesn't look as severe. So so the Leslie Stahl article on 60 Minutes, they were talking about women and men in heart attacks, mm -hmm. and they said one of the gender differences that may be significant is that men have been told, take an aspirin a day and it will help prevent heart attacks. Right. That for women, it does not help prevent heart attacks. I know, attacks, I hate that because I've been telling women to take stroke. I've been telling women to take aspirin, a, yeah. an 81 milligram aspirin for years. Yeah. And 
I believe, and I take something that's similar so I don't have to do that, but right. I believe that that was protective because that's what all the studies said. They didn't say this is protective for men. No, they, they don't said, say men. They said they it's say, protective for everyone. Yeah. So you read the study, it makes sense, mm-hmm. and then you start telling your patients that. So, I, so I'm kind of a victim of, of the research and so, reading the research because so, I've told my patients I pass that along. That's how patients know what right. to do. So how do we go forward then? One, one of the, the obvious solutions would seem to be to begin to use female animals in medical research at a much higher level mm-hmm. and begin to accumulate data that notes the differentials. Right. I mean, it's not just using female animals. It's, it's using one drug on male animals, female animals, and then, then they have to go to f- people studies. So, and then you have to use it on males and females and note the difference in side effects and effectiveness. So, so being a cynic... <laughs> My thought is that drug companies will take drug A, which right now is given to everybody, and they're going to say drug A is a male drug, and we're going to continue to call it whatever we've called it. And then we're going to produce a half a dose of that and color it a different color and call it a female drug and charge a whole lot more money for that. Yeah, probably. That's what they do. They do with something called finasteride, or uh-huh. uh, it's, a, it's a drug for... Um, Female hair loss or male hair loss. Okay, okay. so they, but you, it can also be used for prostate. So the male dose is generic and inexpensive, and the female dose, which is one fifth the dose, is not generic and very expensive. That's obscene. It made it's like why do the cleaners charge more to do my shirts than my husband? Because well, they button backwards. <laughs> really. <laughs> They do. Didn't you know that? Yeah, I know they button backwards. That's not why they charge more. It's because oh. they can. Cause that's they the deal. Can. And so that's right. the thing with the with the pharmaceutical companies. It's because they can. Yeah. So what we're we're talking about and what they finally touched on, which I've been waiting for, is mm-hmm. for somebody like Leslie Stahl to look at this and say, wait a second. Yeah. It may be 20 years late, but it's better than, you know, it's better than nothing. Right. Is that, yes, women and men metabolize drugs differently they need a different dose they have different side effects and all of those things should be known when you prescribe a drug right but the drug the drug should be the same it shouldn't be a different patent but just the same dose or different different doses yeah so you change the dose when we're the la the other thing i wanted to explain was in pediatrics Mm -hmm. when we have babies and children we actually figure out the weight and the body mass right. for, for each child so that we give them the proper dose for their size. Right. So we do that until they become 15 or 16, and then it's one size fits all. So that needs to continue because there's little tiny adults oh, yeah. that don't need as much of whatever we're giving them. Well, we're them. finding that in treating older people who, who've begun to shrink again. They've shrunk, and their their liver and kidneys don't metabolize as fast. Right. So that's why we decrease dose for older people. Mm-hmm. But it's not quite about their size. It's more about how they metabolize their, body yeah, their, yeah. their liver and kidneys. But for children, it's size, and it should still be size for us. And There's, it should be size and gender. And gender. That's and, right. And, and so we need to start looking at that. And so the doctors need to be aware of it. Pharmaceutical companies, labs need to be mm-hmm. aware of it. But even being aware of it isn't going to help until they start to accumulate the data yeah, that shows what the differences because are. Because they have to do research on it again. Yeah. And a lot of the drugs have gone generic. There's no money to do research on it. Right. So it's going to be a matter of doctors knowing. I mean, the reason I knew that people had a lot of side effects to cholesterol medicine in for women but not men is because when I started taking care of both, the men had no problem with it. And women were like, oh, man, this is killing me. I can't take it anymore, and my muscles are killing me. And so you see that over and over and over and over again in a day. You start waking up and going, okay, I need to look into this and see why. And that there's a g- gender genetic difference. Right. And you can look for the genes that, that are going to be are going to put you at risk for this. So it is a gender difference, but it's... It's also hooked to our to our genes. It has and to do with being female. Of course, female. your unique perspective is that as long as medicine is going to begin to seriously look at and study gender differences, 
you would like for them to look at and study the gender concerns around testosterone, mm -hmm. especially in terms of making the FDA acknowledge that testosterone is a drug for females too. Right, that's right, and it's kind of ironic. but It's more than ironic. But it's something that will, will change the face of medicine. A lot of medicines yeah. wouldn't be necessary for women if we had testosterone replaced. And, and that's the argument. If, if you replace the testosterone, you can come off of or never need to go on half a dozen or more different medicines that people take matter-of-factly, that, that most people are on at some point. For each, one for each symptom. Yeah. Instead, you just replace the hormone that's missing, which is testosterone, and at very little risk and lots of benefits go off all these other medications. It's, it's, it's efficient, but it's not good business for the pharmaceutical companies. So it's going to take a long time to fight that. So you can learn more about all of this by coming back on a regular basis to watch the Bob Balance Healthcast, but you can also go to thesecretfemalehormone.com and get our book and find a more in-depth and detailed explanation of many of these topics. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.